LC party now has five members of state parliaments in Australia with three reps elected in the last six months. The joining of the age of cannabis means great changes on the political horizon in Australia with steps towards the final nail in the coffin of tired old prohibition. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet, uh, acknowledging their elders past, present and emerging, and uh, pay respects to them. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge all the activists uh, who have worked for many, many decades on this crazy uh, Gordian knot of uh, prohibition um, in our society uh, in relation to cannabis and uh, other drugs um, and say that I'm relatively new I, I, to the issue of cannabis legalisation and the detail of the different models. Uh, I, <clears throat> as a young person, was very focused on hemp. I saw um, hemp, the legalisation and the deregulation of hemp as a way to solve some of our intractable problems about natural resource management. Pr principally, I wanted to see hemp uh, in Tasmania replace forestry, uh, which I thought was, sort of was a, a dead end, rapacious, like an eco-sidal uh, eco industry uh, decimating the Tasmanian forests, and saw that there was this massive history of using this incredible plant, cannabis, uh, uh, in its form of, as hemp, for paper, fibre, plastics, uh, feed for animals uh, and the like. And so I was a proselytiser for hemp at the very beginning. I um, uh, read the works of Jack Herer, read High Times, watched Billion Dollar Crop uh, and was absolutely convinced that we could solve our problems around water management, forestry, um, plastics, so many of these energy, um, our own food sources, um, by um, uh, using hemp. Um, but also, uh, in tandem with that, I was a pretty big uh, uh, supporter of smoking bombs. Uh, when I was 19, 20 years old, I did my utmost to denude Tasmania of, uh, of cannabis. Uh, I went pretty close, but uh, yeah, no, didn't quite get there. But uh, I'm a hippie kid, and I think it's really important that um, as part of an, as an MP, who will go forward and advocate for industrial hemp, uh, advocate for hemp for medicine, advocate for legalisation in, uh, or decriminalisation, whatever form uh, that we want, but I'm a big supporter of, legal, of legalisation. Um, I think it's really important that we uh, also have a member of the parliament who's going to advocate for cannabis culture, the culture that comes with uh, ending prohibition. The fact that we shouldn't, you know, and Nimbin is the example of what it's like when the culture is on display. It's been an absolutely fundamental part of the spiritual and ecological awakening uh, of Australia was the use of um, uh, illicit drugs, as they call it, which are mind-expanding substances. The, the two things are intertwined, they are the same thing. The, the, the awakening to the, to the planet, to the, the effects we were having on it, uh, and the use of uh, cannabis. And I, I'm a hippie kid. I was born in 1973. Um, you know, I was born at the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Um, I'm turning 50 this year. My parents were hippies. I grew up, you know, in houses with no power and long drop toilets and all the rest of it. Parents grew and smoked dope. Um, and I'm proud of our culture. I think that we've done um, uh, amazing things in terms of arts, poetry, writing, thinking, um, uh, tourism, uh, and benefiting the economy. And that's something that um, we should be putting on the table. It's not just about um, the, the, the economics of it, but it's also about the, uh, the, the depth and breadth of uh, you know of our society, and I think cannabis decriminalised the cannabis. Sorry, any cannabis prohibition um, will only further that, and that's something that I think we should really uh, make front and centre of uh, the case we put in the parliaments as the legalised cannabis party. 
um, emerges, and it's just it's just so exciting. This doesn't happen all the time, uh, where a social movement breaks through into parliaments. It's a credit to the people who've worked um, to get the political party registered. It's a credit to all the people who uh, volunteered, handed out how to vote, campaigned, shared things on social media that we broke through. And all the other politicians are looking around and going, what the fuck? They're going, is this thing going, like, is this a flash in the pan? And they are going, no it is not. This is a broad social movement. Like our, our, our vote is dispersed across class, geography, all to different types of demographics. Um, and the opposition to, uh, 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 to cannabis legalisation is dissipating. The, um, the, it's, it's like, basically, I've, repli I've taken Fred Niles' seat in the <laughs> Legislative Council. So, <laughs> after a thousand years, Fred Niles <laughs> has finally ended his reign. Um, and, uh, but he's retreating to his castle, to somewhere, to, to <laughs> hop back in his coffin and recuperate. But, um, but that's, that's what's happened. Uh, uh, the opposition to prohibition, to prohibition um, is disappearing because the, the right of politics is going, this doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense socioeconomically. It doesn't make sense in terms of their ideology of, you know, just personal choice and their libertarian bent. Um, and it doesn't make sense electorally now. And that's the thing that scares them the most. Is there's only one horse ever in the race, and that's self-interest. And the Liberal Party are going, who are the people using cannabis in this country? And it's older women, 55 years and older. And they're voting, and they are advocates for this. They're going, I'm using medicinal cannabis, and I'm telling my friends. I've started using CBD, and it's changed my life. You know, I've got a granddaughter who's got um, epilepsy, and now her life has been transformed because of cannabis. And they are making that case. And so if you've got that demographic, as well as younger people, you've got people living regionally and working class people. And there's a lot of us, working class people who've always smoked pot, um, done so safely in a responsible sort of way, and it's just been part of our lives. Those people all together add up enough to enough people to elect people to parliaments, to potentially elect someone to the Senate and to make change. Um, and so that's where, uh, that's where we're up to. I think that um, it's an incredible opportunity, but I for one feel a lot like the dog that caught the car. You know, you chased really hard, you caught the car, and now you just go, now what do we do? And it's, this, is, this is an incredibly exciting opportunity to get it right. And I don't think we should, um, we should rush in in any particular way. Um, I think that we should um, build the case because as, look, with the Legalised Cannabis Party in Victoria uh, and New South Wales, we're in the balance of power. We can actually bring the Labor Party across. And so that's, that is, the, that is the, the, the nut that we have to crack, is the New South Wales Labor Party, the Victorian Labor Party, um, and there are already um, cracks in the facade, their opposition to it. The New South Wales Premier, Chris Minns, is on the record saying prohibition hasn't worked, it doesn't make sense, the sense as a social policy, as an economic policy, and he's walked that back pretty much straight away. But um, there's others in the party that are making that case. They've got their drug summit, which is just kicking things down the, the road, um, uh, and there's, but there's already the evidence, there's already um, the, uh, the, the recognition that there's uh, a movement in society that wants this changed. So we can go to work and we can get this reform done. Um, uh, there's going to be lots of challenges there. Um, and I interestingly, the, 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 the people who seem most interested in reforming um, a, a, the legal cannabis, in, um, especially here in New South Wales, seem to be the bean counters. They're, it's treasury. And there's an old saying, never get between a politician and a bucket of money. And the New South Wales government has got a really big problem 
uh, on their hands, which is a, uh, a, a budget in real trouble. They're looking for every dollar they can find. They've, uh, they've got mega projects they're building in Sydney. They are exposed in terms of their um, debt um, and they're the biggest uh, in infrastructure projects in Australia. They are looking for money to service their debt, to keep the lights on and to provide services. So they are looking for alternatives. And when you look at the scale of the cannabis industry, and you might not agree with the, uh, the form of it in places like Canada and the United States, they are looking at the billions and billions of dollars that are flowing into the state and federal coffers and going, we need a, a, a bit of that. So if we can put forward reasonable um, amendments to legislation, reasonable reforms, reasonable regu regulation, it's going to be ve and that step us towards um, a regulated, um, uh, reformed industry, the Labor Party are going to find it very, very difficult to oppose because it makes sense in terms of saving money in the criminal justice system. They can create these industries in terms of industrial hemp, recreational cannabis, the medicinal cannabis industry growing, um, and, um, um, uh, and save money, create uh, create a huge industry and the employ employment that goes with it, um, and uh, unlock unlock the cultural phenomenon that would be a, um, a an end to prohibition in this country. So it's a, it's an incredible challenge. Um, I think that we need to. My, my view is because I'm a new MP and I'm getting across the policy detail. We should hasten slowly because we what we put on the table first will be really scrutinised. And it's really important that we do the, the modelling, talk to the stakeholders, and that's what this process is about. Like I've, I've just learnt so much in the last, you know, six hours. It's unbelievable. Just, just the hearing Paul Benham talking about the, the possibility of, you know, industrial plastics from hemp. Um, learning about the other experiences um, in, in other in Victoria with the legalised cannabis party there. So it's an incredible opportunity. It doesn't come around very often, um, and a political phenomenon like legalised cannabis is incredibly rare. It's very rare for a political party to break through really quickly in a lot of places and who are getting votes from across the spectrum. And it absolutely terrifies the, uh, the, the politicians. The only solution to that problem of us taking seats from them, becoming a big player in terms of preferences and who actually forms governments, is to legalise cannabis. That's going to be their motivation. They need to get rid of us, solve this problem, uh, otherwise electorally we'll be taking two, three seats in, in each state, we, we, we could be electing senators and then they've got a, then it's just not going to go away. But um, that's how I see it. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that the big challenge too now for the legalised cannabis party is we've got to deal with other issues as well. So we've, we've, we've got legislators in and we've got to deal with issues like privatisation of assets, industrial relations reform and things that are sort of outside our remit. So on all those things we're taking uh, like a reasoned approach, talking to the experts um, but really trying to keep the focus in, in, in all these things. In, doing what we were put there to do, which is to free pot, uh, legalise cannabis and push, push a progressive drug law reform more generally. So thanks very much everyone. Jim Moylan, there you are. <laughs> um, I've, uh, two comments really do occur to me. Um, thank God for someone who's stressing the importance of cannabis culture and the history of cannabis culture and the movement in Australia. Um, my real in first long term in organising, and I got involved way back in the normal days, but the first organised involvement was really running around Australia about 10 years ago, holding activist workshops all around Australia in Hyde Park and screaming at all of the people getting it together. 
and getting that movement organised. And I just feel in, in the last 10 or so years with all the activity, in a lot of ways we're losing focus on the, the movement rather than the political ambitions. Because the problem at the moment is when you lose sight of the movement, you lose sight of that harm that's being inflicted every day on people in the suburbs. And you also lose focus on the actual day-to-day -day problems that just cannabis users, urban cannabis users in Australia have for no apparent benefit to anyone. Which all leads to my second point. Um, I've been in Europe and I've been to everywhere where cannabis is legal. Um, this year I spent a, a month in, in Thailand touring all of the industry from the Madam Se Under Secretary down to dealers in the street. And there we have a wonderful model to follow simply because the proposition is to tailor the regulation and legislation to the, the harm which they can see attaching to the use of cannabis. Simple as that. The problem that you see in all of the Western world jurisdictions is the response to an, a massive over-regulation and legalisation is build more regulation, spend more money on building a brand new bureaucracy for can. Whereas, I think we have to start very at the beginning with just simple first principles. Harm reduction, regulation and legislation which is relative and appropriate to the level of harm which is social and personal harm that can attach to cannabis use. And now, so many years into this movement, we have a really, really big knowledge base demonstrating that there is very little, there's far more harm attaching to aspirin or paracetamol or sugar abuse, right? And that's where we have to start. Rather, it seems that the cannabis law reform movement throughout the Western world has been dealing on the legislatures and, legislatures and the regulator, re, regulators' terms all the way. Build more, spend more, regulate more, when this whole problem can go away if they simply stop enforcing all of these silly laws and regulations that are doing nothing for anyone. That first principle stuff. And yeah. so, thank I, God that you're here. No, I appreciate that. Um, look, uh, a social movement is only as strong as it's connected, like as an advocate as, uh, 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 for a social movement, your, your, your movement and your, uh, is only as strong as those connections. And if you're not um, relaying, like in my experience as a politician, I was eight years in New South Wales Upper House, um, I was just an advocate, really. You know, I, I was stealing other people's ideas because it's you, you talk to the policy wants, you look at other areas where you've got regulation or less regulation than the rest, and you look at what's best practice and you apply that to the real world problems. You know, the term that everyone uses now is lived experience. And I remember seeing uh, during the election campaign a grandmother standing on a, uh, a veranda with her daughter, um, and her daughter had um, uh, MS um, and was taped, and they were, they were and it was chronic pain and all these other conditions as well. And this grandmother was just saying, "All I want to do is grow six plants for my granddaughter." You know, as a as a as a first principle, she's not a cannabis user. She's just got she's got the space. They're living in my house because where I'm a carer, and this is what I want to do. And so th that's exactly I think where we should start at the grassroots with highlighting the um, with the problems that people face in real world terms. And that 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 is how that is how politicians should and have dealt with everything. Like your your industrial relations policy should deal to real workplace issues. You know. How we deal with women's issues should deal to their lived experiences in in workplaces and in life, and so um, and and with our First Nations people, that's exactly it. You know, we have to listen to those uh, and give those examples in Parliament. That's what I did when I was campaigning against fossil fuels and coal seam gas. I'd just go in and go, this is the detail of people's real lived experience in dealing with fossil fuel exploration on their land, pollution, um, uh, you know, the, the, the ecological devastation that people experienced, 
and then saying to the, the politicians, fix it. And we've got some ideas, we'll work with you. But um, yeah, absolutely, I think it's fundamental to, um, for the legalised cannabis um, party and the movement to keep and to build on uh, its social uh, connections, its movement, because otherwise, if we just become a parliamentary party, uh, and, and we, you get captured, you get sucked into the inside the beltway, you lose that connection, um, and um, you're, you're, you, you, um, you can end up, as you say, putting forward a whole heap of reforms that don't reflect the needs of the people. Yeah, Eugene. Hi. That's awesome, thank you. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to ask you that. Yep. Um, so, uh, cannabis falls in the uh, category of what we call teacher plants because it has a psychoactive element. I'd like to just ask a personal question. Do you take teachings from the plant itself when working with the plant? And if so, uh, how do those teachings guide you personally? Well, um, uh, I've always found, as someone who's you know smoked pot and grown pot, that uh, that you have to avoid the teachings of. Uh, yeah, the answer is yes, I, I have found. And what I've found is that the 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 plant. Um, the experience of you know cannabis is one that teaches uh, teaches you about the interconnectedness of things, the complexity of things, that the, the things are interrelated, that one problem over here that you may see is actually connected to another problem somewhere else. That, that those relationships, and so um, yeah, the, the 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 short answer is absolutely, and. Um, and it's all always taught me that you can't deal with things in a silo. You can't just sort of draw a boundary around something and say, you know, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about cannabis culture. What's cannabis culture? It's, it's, it's a web. It's an interconnected web that goes into every aspect of, um, uh, uh, of life, our society, and the planet. You know, it's an... It, and so... Uh, that's what it's taught me, is that, you know, the, the interconnectedness of things, you can't draw political, you know, and humanistic boundaries around things um, uh, because <clears throat> that's not how our universe works. So that wisdom teaching from the plant, do you see a way that you can bring that sort of teaching to a place like a parliamentary ecology or, or society? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and the way you do it is you 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 find ways to talk of like um, everyone says that legalised cannabis is a single policy party, which is true. We've got that, policy. but the issues that emerge from legalising cannabis, like one a really big one that I'm learning about now is racism. Yeah. That 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 how the intersection of prohibition and racism. The two things are the same thing, you know? So I've been reading up about, you know, Harry Anslinger and the Narcotics Act and the pursuit of Billie Holiday, you know, and it's just absolutely abysmal. And the use of prohibition to suppress all kinds of social movements and minorities. Like, you know, this week, Tangaraj Supia, you know, a 46-year-old guy in Singapore, executed for one and a half kilos of pot that he may or may not have had some involvement in importing, um, and that's that's a vehicle for an oppressive regime to hold down its society. Just go, you know. Singapore execution. Yeah, Singapore. Didn't I say Singapore? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's just totally fucked. And so one of the first things I'm going to do in Parliament is write to the President of Singapore, write to the, and say, this is about human rights, you know? And so they use pot. So that's, that's, there's so many facets for the governments use control, corporations use governments to control, um, to control us that we can apply what, you know, the, the essence of our movement is, which is, you know, about freedom, it's about expression, uh, and it's about, you know, the truth of, you know, of, uh, of plants, 
medicine uh, and uh, our beautiful planet. All right. We're be nice. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, it's a hard question, but it's one I'd be really interested in. It's something I think about a lot. Um, thanks for your talk and congratulations. It's great to see you're a fantastic communicator too, which is so important in political leadership on many issues like this one in particular. But the thing I wanted to ask is, um, I, I don't often talk to the police, but I do sometimes. And one thing that they highlight is the roadside and the around cameras. You know, mentioned the, the point that people sometimes raise about young people in some places that definitely comes up as well. The other one that I'm just really concerned about is that there's the uh, foreground the issues related to driving. Recreationally, use cannabis. Obviously, there's a big very personal interest in getting the forms. Uh, sorry, in getting the driving laws made better. Up. The concern I've got is well, how do we um, both get that job done without continuing to centralise the risk of uh, of road safety, which is the, basically the police narrative. That's the thing that they want to make front and centre in discussions about law reform. It's a bit of a hard question because like, I don't know. This, but do you have a sense of how we can both pursue driving reforms without um, sort of acquiescing to having debates about cannabis reform on the terms of the list one? Um, no, I don't. Oh, the, the short answer is no, I don't. And, and that's the puzzle that we've got. But um, I think that we have to fill the, the sort of knowledge vacuum. So the, the, any push for like trials, um, um, and having a look at, uh, like in the in the sort of contemporary context of um, with medicinal cannabis patients, um, that's something we have to do. So look at look at trials, like data, new data about you know are people who are on medicinal cannabis you know uh, overrepresented in you know uh, in crashes and and the, and the rest the the data and also really. Um, uh, hold the the police to account on uh, an area where they, because of um, the success of RBT, they've just applied, they've just cut and paste that to RDT, and that, like RBT worked, it absolutely did, you know, and but it was based on a, a, a scientific threshold. I mean, when I grew up, it was 0.08 in Tasmania. Yeah, <laughs> bring that back. And then they worked, they, that didn't work actually, so they brought it down, but. They've just cut and paste that into their model of mass testing, you know. And so we need to, I think, um, we need to, uh, as part of providing new data, actually have a look at what they're basing their information on, and have that complex discussion um, in the context, you know, of uh, while they maintain that. Um, while well, they maintain that position, there's some harm being done in the community. People are just being forced to, to break the law, to drive on their medicine. People aren't taking their medicine. So what are they going to do? You know, how are they going to fix this intractable situation? The only, the only way we can deal with it is reform um, and uh, to, you know, to hold them to account. In terms of the, you know, I've had people say to me, you know, cannabis and psychosis and young people. You know, my experience, and I think a lot of the the, the literature, you know, peer reviewed and the rest that's coming out is, you know, psychosis and mental health can lead to cannabis abuse. And I think it's uh, that's the the discussion that we're now having about the nature of addiction and mental health and, and the and the like. And so that's a that's it's complex. It's not always one way. But we need to do that, in, in, and that's one of the things I really want to, I'm really pleased to see in Victoria, them doing the work in terms of inquiries and, 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 and pushing uh, to get the data, um, and that's what I'm going to do in Parliament, is say, like, why, what are you basing the, this policy on? It, your, 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 your policy's out of date, or the data is contested, and that's how we do it. We, we base it on uh, the, the facts, and, and the research, and there's more and more people emerging to help us with that, um, and that's that's the real work, the policy work. Absolutely, that's what 
we're that's what we're learning. I mean, medicinal cannabis is like five years old, legal medicinal cannabis, and so who's been collating the data? And so the the experience of like it is like it is just so amazing how much diversity there is because every person is different, their illness is different, their medicine is different, how they live their lives is different. You know, so you know the. That there's 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 so much information that we don't have, and um, uh, now we can uh, begin to gather it, so we can have policy settings that reflect the reality of people's lives. And so, you know, uh, it's really it's really exciting. I'm seeing some, of, especially the stuff that the Victorians are doing um, in terms of drug driving law reform, the the, the research there, um, and I think it's really exciting to see um, a, a rational. Uh, approach uh, to this issue, and that should be applied um, to all areas of medicinal cannabis use and in those discussions. Because the I would say this that the um, you know the the opposition to medicinal cannabis, recreational cannabis, drug driving law reform is not very nuanced. It's just cannabis leads to psychosis, and that's, that's it. And cannabis leads to car accidents, and then they you say, well, hold on, we've got some information that says something different, or uh, we've got a different view, what about this, what about that? They go, oh, hold on, oh, have you seen what I said at the start? Cannabis, you know, they just, they, it's not a, and the, and the thing is, they haven't been challenged for a very long time, you know, or ever, if ever, um, and um, they, yeah, they, they haven't been um, challenged in an organised and persistent way. The way you get social reform is to just bang away like a broken record on something until someone just says, I'll piss off. <laughs> you know, that's how that's how change happens. You know, you bang, 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 and then you have, you have your breakthrough. And so that's the way to do it. But we can't, you know, do it by just saying it's the vibe, you know, and you're being unfair. We've got to base it on the on the um, the data. And, and, the, and the systems, we have to play their game and say, well, hold on, you're wrong. Uh, and, and we've got a different view. So that's, you know, that's... Yeah, that is, exa that is exactly right. Yeah, and there's... Uh, there's Exactly, or they, you know, that they, they may have been had alcohol or another drug too. Yeah, and the other thing we've got to acknowledge that there's a massive business model for the police in maintaining prohibition. I mean, they're all on double time up there, get to ride the horses, you know, turn up here. This is part of their business plan. Like all of us, and, and those police commissioners are about one thing, is, is getting more money into their budget. You know, it's about funding, and so we need to be able to say, well, hold on, to the treasurer, we can solve this problem, increase revenue, not create harm on our roads, um, and I'm sorry, you can, you can take, you know, a couple hundred million dollars out of the police's you know, budget and you can put the helicopter in the shed forever. So, you know. Well, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the helicopters, are, I moved to Bellingen only like seven years ago and the getting, you know, hawk force with the drones and the, and the cops uh, in the, like, driving around and the big four-wheel drives, the blue, big blue, just everyone's on the text, on the telegram. And they just go bluebird in the sky, yeah, and they're directly funded by the Yeah. Well, it's a massive waste of money, and it also, you know, is an assault on our freedom. So we'll be making that case. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's really it's a massive honour and privilege to represent a huge community on an issue. As I said, is not just it, it's a single policy massive, massive issues that are applied to every every aspect of our lives. So, um, you know, there's been so many people do great work. Fiona, you know, hemp, normal, all of them over decades. And I'm going, and all the NGOs around the place doing work on, you know, progressive drug law reform. I'm going to take that, put it in the parliament, 
And uh, it, it's really, like, we are in a super powerful position in New South Wales. There's a few things to lock into place over the next week. But the New South Wales government may need my vote on absolutely everything that they need, or just about everything they need to get through. And I'm going to be saying, sure, I'll come talk to you, but here's a, here's a, a couple of issues that uh, our community's got. All right, thanks everyone. Have you ever heard of monatomic gold? No. Gold is actually...